a single in this case, at least a single HTTP request is not enough because we need, uh, when we response related to the user, we miss some information. We miss data. We need to uh, send a HTTP request to fetch them. And there is another related problem. It's the plus one problem. Is that every time I have a relation, I need to wait current of this relation, then create an extra request. If I have a collection, a collection of, for instance, and I want to retry every single post of this collection, I need to make the request for the collection, then a request for every post in this collection. So it's a very uh, well-known issue with REST APIs uh, to introduce a, a latency. Another problem is the over problem. This time is in a HTTP request, you retry a lot of data, big JSON, for instance, you don't, you don't display the screen, all the data that you generated. You waste bandwidth and uh, you waste computer, computation, uh, you waste resources, thing because it is. There is a well known alternative uh, to REST that fixes this problem. It's called RESTful. Basically, but I think most of you uh, is already aware of GraphQL, the client can, in the server of what it needs, exactly what it needs, and only what it needs. So in a single HTTP request, the client will ask everything it needs, and the server will write with everything that has been related, with that has been related, and including relations between But do we still need RefQL with HTTP2? HTTP is a new protocol with the version of HTTP uh, from the ground up to make the web. It's a binary protocol, so by design it's faster. It supports multiplexing, it supports request prioritization, means that client and server can negotiate what is uh, the important resources and they will be downloaded first. It has super Server. We'll speak a bit more about that in a few minutes. It has support for either question, and there is a new version again of the call of HT that is being deployed called HT3. It's again a new version that has produced a lot of performance in France. And the main thing is that instead of using HTTP, it uses UDP. One very interesting capability of HTTP2 is multiplexing. It means that in a single TCP or UDP with HTTP3 connection, you can download in parallel as many really, TCP responses as you need. It's the same thing for the request. You can see in parallel as many requests needed. So this is one of the uh, most important bottleneck of HTTP and its built in. The second uh, very interesting capability is push. In HTTP 1, let's say that you have a web page index.html. This page uh, to display those these two extra files, the application.js file and style.css. And the CSS file has references to basically um, what we your web browser, loading the index email page, and it will be loaded, it will start passing the HTML, it will the references, and at this point, it will extra HTTP request. This creates what of, but this is not something that is very uh, optimal because as a as web developer, we know that it's not necessary. No that uh, uh, we display users, the client will have to download all the files at the same time. So I think that is possible with HTTP2. It's called HTTP2 server push. Basically, the web developer can say, OK, the client will the index the email page. And the server will push exactly at the same time and in parallel thanks to complexing uh, all files that are 
uh, to be the script will by the HTML that is the JavaScript, for instance, then will already be in a cache called the push cache and will be able to be used instantly. HTTP is already supported by all both and almost every internet have uh, software that supports out of the box. So you right now. And if it's not uh, your servers aren't configured to use HTTP right now, you should do it because even without server push, uh, it has a very impressive moment. So let's speak about Vulkan. And it's two things. First, it's a protocol that has been run uh, on the internet drive that is public on GitHub and on the IETF website. So it's the specification STINI protocol. There is also in the same Git repository uh, a reference implementation that is a, a gate server, a repository that is to use, that is open source, that is written to that you put the existing web API to enable Vulkan this API without having to provide the existing code. These examples I use uh, the uh, API Mastodon, the activity pub IP. So it's a centralized source. Uh, I'm not speak about the concept of uh, behind this API, but have something out box. It's a JSON document. You can retry the REST API needed by master. These are box relations activities. And activity relation to the object here, statuses. So it means that the status is in the outbox, you have to make a lot of requests and you have waterfall. Because first, you need to download the outbox resource, then you need to parse it using a JSON parser to find the relation to the status to the activity in the order key, to start new TP request to the activities, then every activity has to a and activity at the load, then you need a TP request to unload the status. So you have a lot of can enter a new HTTP call that takes as value a set when JSON document will be a JSON pointer. And you can in the set that you can with relations and traverse all relation graph. Here with this vector that I need all activities in the order and for all activities I need the status will be the in the object of the activity. HTTP2 server push, a Vulkan API, when the first outbox request will be sent, in rest this it will run with the data that are needed, the HTTP responses that are needed, the out, all the activity, all the statuses. How to use this in JavaScript? Actually, you have nothing to do, it's bit transparent on the side. Here I use box in Chrome, box in Safari, box everywhere. So use the fetch native function, request to the box on. And as my Vulkan HTTP headers, preload HTTP header. And I say I want all relations under the items. Then I decode the JSON document, I loop of all the other items, and I do another uh, batch of HTTP requests to find the related activities. But actually, because of HTTP2 server push, the reply, the responses will have been loaded in parallel with the outbox. So fetch will return, return instantly because the data will be already there. So it's very, very easy to use. If you use the Chrome network, for instance, you can see uh, you know, uh, it looks. So basically, if you don't use Vulkan, um, it's what the left. 
Then you have waterfalls. You need to wait for the outbox to start downloading the activity. And you need to wait for the activity to start downloading the status field. When you use Vulkan, everything is loaded in parallel as, as replies of the first request. And there are no more waterfalls. It is downloaded instantly. So you have a very impressive performance boost. So it fixes the unfetching problem. It fixes this one problem. It allows to download all resources in parallel thanks to the multiplexing pieces of HTTP. Allows to use the HTTP cache mechanism. So for instance, if one activity is the one of ID one is already been seen by this browser and already in cache, then the browser will not download this one. Download only the activities and in right. It's a fast API, and it can leverage all the capabilities of the prototype. So there is another option that is less interesting, in my opinion, but still in Vulkan that allows to filter the request to fetch to fact to the overfetch. So you can use the field HTTP header to, with the same kind of select to check the property you want. In this example, the property appearing in the fields will be done. All the other properties of these JSON documents will be stored by the server and be downloaded. So there are other capabilities in Vulkan. You the ability to use other kind of select instance X or XML, uh, compatible mode with HTTP1, ability to use parameters in, instead of uh, HTTP headers and support for other needs. This is a implementation you can use for to turn existing API into a view API. This server is open, though, open source and you can download it right now. There are images and everything you need to use it right now to test Vulkan on top of your API without having to implement anything yourself. To do this, you download this go by set the of your upstream API and you have a working API. Vulkan is also able to with any uh, non IPA API. Activity API is an IPA one. We URL as the library everywhere. But Vulkan, you can have a legacy API, a traditional API, uh, where the functions will use plain ID. Yeah, if I have a book related to an author, but I don't know the URL of this author. Vulkan cannot uh, get what is the URL to push. You can use open API specification, uh, the, the earlier known as Swagger, to uh, document the relations in the document. And the Vulkan Gateway server will be able, able to use your um, open API specification and will be able um, to uh, find, to construct the relations, the URLs of the documentation. And so it will work when you will use a proper Vulkan selector. Um, for instance, you will ask when you download the hook to also push uh, the relate. If you have Swagger, it will work as expected, even if your API is not an item. So uh, let's speak just quickly just a bit about GraphQL. Vulkan HTTP2 server push as a big benefit of our GraphQL is um, a big JSON document. With GraphQL, you will ask the to construct a JSON document containing all the relations, all the resources that you need. And you will download that. It's not the case with Vulkan, where it's proper HTTP request that are and so it means that the multiplexing will be used. It will be a, uh, your server will be able to generate responses in parallel. And thanks to the multiplexing, your client will be able to download all the resources in parallel. It's not possible to download a big JSON document in parallel. Um, also, uh, there is the ability to use full power of the cache, the HTTP cache. And it's not always with graph because of the same. Well, it's more than just a way to fix the and the overfetching problem. It's also a query language, a type 
and then it has a built-in introspection mechanism, subscriptions, grip tooling, and Vulkan has nothing like that. But Vulkan is a layer of HTTP layers that you can use with your or REST API. And REST has everything uh, to this gap to it has open API, obviously, formerly known as Swagger. It has a internet and internet scale type system that is standardized by the W3C that is called JSON ID and using our it has an hypermedia introspection system very, very cool that is called that is under the umbrella of the W3C2. If you attended to my talk uh, last year or yes, in 2018 actually about Mercure, you can see that. In REST, it's very easy to use this protocol um, to do something like what well, you subscription. It's uh, the thing that you can use for your APIs. Obviously, GraphQL is a very good thing, but REST has nice tooling too. And GraphQL has a big problem over REST APIs is that everything that is leveraging the capability of the HTTP protocol, like servers, you have varnish, web application firewall to detect. Uh, um, um, sensitive requests, requests to, to, to check what are the most requested resources to go access, API gateway tools, they just see a request to post GraphQL. With the REST API, with you, all the benefits of being able to use the full capability of the HTTP protocol. And regarding the tooling, uh, you can very easily create very Impressive REST API using the API platform framework, obviously, it also supports REST um, and GraphQL, but uh, it's very, very easy and it has native support for Vulkan. There is similar tools, for instance, there is GraphQL that is very interesting in Ruby always, and client side, there are emerging that are very interesting, for instance, from Zide creators of next. And, uh, Try Zeit SW with Vulkan and it allows to download with Vulkan the HTTP responses in parallel and to render them client side using React uh, in parallel. We are working on a new JavaScript library that will use a Vulkan that is very straightforward. It will be released in the next few days, so follow me on Twitter if you want more information about that. So, Vulkan is fast, designed for the open web at its core. Easy to deploy thanks to the open source gateway server, so you can have any existing API in a Vulkan one. Uh, it is compatible with all the tools, the tools in HTTP. It can be supported in minute by your existing web API. And there is more. If you really like SQL syntax, because it's a very nice syntax, you can use the Apollo REST link library to execute GraphQL library. Uh, queries that will hit a Vulkan server. So you have the best of both worlds. Give it a try. It's brand new, but it's promising. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Very interesting stuff. I'm looking forward to try it out. You can stop sharing your screen. You can also log out from, from the channel here. We don't really have time for questions, but I can see from the chat, if you go in the sessions, there are at least two or three questions for you. So make sure to check that out. Um, I will. Yeah, perfect. I will. Thank you very much. Corin, uh, she's a technical documentation manager at Twitch. She's going to be talking with us about um, doc well for your developer relationship people. So let's give a couple of seconds for our next speaker to join the channel. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. <laughs> All right, should be just a little button next to the camera, microphone, and then the screen next to the calls. Perfect. I already made okay, a Okay, now I just have to find what I want. So I'm leaving the stage to you and take it away. Okay. Um, Yes, so Docwell for DevRel. About me, um, I have four degrees and none of them have anything to do with software. 
I've been a technical writer now for almost 25 years. Although I've taken a few detours, I've worked as a support engineer, I've worked as a curriculum developer, and I took a sabbatical and worked as a chef. Went to culinary school just, and all. I think you're sharing you... the wrong screen, so we can't really see your slides exactly. We can see your presenter notes, but not the slides. Okay, thank you. Let me try yeah. to figure out how to do this. <laughs> I eight episodes of times. Sorry, everybody. Not a problem at all. Is this the right one? That's perfect. All right, take it away. Okay, then <laughs> we'll try get, try this again. Um, I also play fewer video games than most people at Twitch uh, because I don't like shooting, not even pixels. However, I am currently obsessed with Animal Crossing. If you would like to be friends on Nintendo Switch, hit me up. Anyway, all of these things inform my work as a, as a developer writer and a developer advocate. Okay, so about my job, after several reorgs, we have those a lot, I am now on the developer relations team. In the past, I've mostly been part of engineering teams, and once I was, and once I was a tech writer, documentation manager on the support team. But what I actually manage at Twitch is external customer-facing doc. Our customers are developers. There is a different team that handles internal documentation. So a different view. And these are from my experience. And of course, your experiences may vary, and I would like to hear about them. There are pros and cons to being a tech writer in an engineering team. Pros are you get firsthand knowledge of the product, product changes, deadline slips, all that stuff because you're right there on the team. Everybody already knows how to use JIRA and it makes sense to them that you're using JIRA to track doc and you get a really close relationship with developers and dev managers. On the con side, you don't have a big picture view of documentation user experience. You're generally writing documentation on one product or a piece of a product and not looking at how the whole, about the information architecture of the whole package. You tend to not have any customer contact and Doc teams have a tendency towards silos. Being a tech writer and support has pros and cons as well. Um, lots of customer contact, which is both a pro and a con, because you're talking to customers, you're understanding how they really use the product, you're getting good feedback. On the other hand, sometimes they're unhappy, even angry. You can see documentation in use because support engineers are actually using the doc, and that's always a good thing, again, for feedback. You have a view of the whole product, not just a small piece of it. And the documentation tends to be in the form of knowledge base articles or blog posts and things like that. And that's fun to write <laughs> for me. On the con side, the other con is that you tend to have a lack of access to the product before release. Being a tech writer and developer relations has been new to me. And on the pro side, direct access to customers. Um, get to run beta tests of the doc along with beta tests of product. Lots of varied kinds of content that I'm producing and we'll go into more later. And you're actually building the whole doc experience for developers, not just writing pieces of content. On the con side, customers have direct access to me. We have an NDA Slack channel. I get a lot of direct messages in, like, and that tends to be interruptive. And the other con for me is I'm having to develop a business brain. This does not come naturally to me, but now that I'm working closer to the business side of things, I have to understand how that relates to doc. And I don't always have an answer. So I wanna focus on the positives here and building the doc experience, or that is the developer portal is the crux of why it's really cool to be a tech writer on a DevRel team. I'm gonna give you a definition here. Um, it's documentation is all of the information that documents an API, developer doc that is. It's easy to use doc as a synonym for API reference and I'm guilty of that myself, but really all of these things are part of the developer experience and they're all important. Getting started, uh, SDKs, guides, FAQs, tutorials, videos, anything you can offer. What makes good developer documentation? API doc is a concise reference that provides developers with the information they need to work with another application. 
it's important because it's the API reference is the user interface for the product, which is the API. As you build out your API, you want to ensure that you not only provide informational API documentation to help your developers integrate, but you also want to re uh, but also return back relevant data that when it, whenever a user makes a call, especially a call that fails. You want to provide developers with quick references to what happens with a call, including the use of status codes. And in the case of a failure, it's important to provide descriptive error messages that tell the client not just what went wrong, but how to fix it. Because fundamentally, developers don't want to call for help. They want to solve their own problems. And hi, Catalin. <laughs> Um, what makes a good developer portal? Uh, I think there are five bullets here. How well does it help users understand your API? How does it establish trust with you and your product? How can your, your developer portal help users quickly get started using the API, the quality of your API reference, and what forms of support do you offer? Portals have grown. Hi, Karen, too. Uh, they used to be a stat listing of endpoints, and that was considered enough. Now that APIs have grown into products, and it's imperative for every API provider to treat internal and external APIs as products, associated portals are expected to provide product orientation. So how well does your API, your doc portal help users understand the API? You want to be able to help newcomer developers learn enough about your API that they'll feel comfortable using it. To do this, you want to include narratives. And narratives also aimed at possibly less technical decision makers. And you want to explain what types of problems the API is good for. Providing use cases is really helpful. Success stories. Because when you're talking to business users who are making decisions, they want to see that so that they spend their money on your product. How can you use your developer portal to establish trust, not only in your, in your documentation, but with your company? You want to have intuitive site architecture. You always want to have good navigation and search. Provide a change log. Provide some kind of API monitor or dashboard so that people can go see if something's not working and get a sense of when it might be back up. A roadmap for upcoming features is cool if you can provide that. And of course, your terms of use. If you provide a terms of use up front, it demonstrates that there's nothing to hide. And you want to accelerate the time to hello world. How quickly does your dev portal help developers start using the API. The next audience you should address is those who envision what they'll be doing and they're ready to consume your API. For these people, you want a getting started guide for high level understanding and put your developers on the right track by taking them through the basic steps. Tutorials and videos are useful. They accommodate different learning styles and they can also show in more detail smaller bites of information. Basically, you want to meet your developers where they are. And along with that, you want to have a really simple and clear registration process so that they're having the access to the parts of the site they need. The API reference. In a perfect world, API documentation would contain clear, complete instructions on everything that developers need to know to use your platform. We're not in a perfect world. <laughs> we all know that. Things that it's really critical to have, authentication, status codes, error handling, sample code, good sample code, sample code that people can copy and test, and example requests and responses. You also want to offer support on your, on your dev portal. The company offers support in the forms of a contact form, your Twitter, your Discord, whatever social media you're using. Like I've mentioned, we have a public NDA Slack for um, key community developers. Key, biz key um, corporate developers have access to solutions architects. And then you want community support so people can support each other. Forums and meetups and conferences. Uh, TwitchCon is a really big deal and it's really fun. And it's not just for streamers and viewers, but there are also developer tracks that happen there. So now that we've talked about the content for a developer portal, what should it look like and how should it be organized? This is a less organized part of my presentation. I'm going to be really honest with you here. These are things I'm still thinking about, and I'm thinking about them as conversation starters. I really look forward to your questions either here or later. Um, 
in terms of the developer portal, developer experience encompasses user experience, information architecture, design, usability, all that stuff. In general, the idea is to find a balance between visuals and content and focus on functionality and usability. Something that's really slick and cool with not a lot of content underneath is actually going to alienate your users way more than an ugly site with good content. Peter Greenbaum proposed this graphic um, about and he organized the four different areas of things you should provide because the first impression when users come to your doc portal is crucial. You want a user experience that organizes the docs so it's easy to find what they want. A good foundation for building the user experience of your portal, you could work with that. And speaking of your company, don't ignore branding and other corporate standards. It should not be a standalone site, even if it, even if it is a standalone site, dev.company.com. Keep adding content. If you're regularly updating your portal, it shows that you're investing in your APIs. Update, keep the documentation updated. Blog posts, they can come from your team, they can come from developers, they can come from PMs, they can come from users. You want to keep that going. Videos, I mentioned that already, and event postings. I know this is a world where we're not having a lot of events and definitely not having them live, but this is a really good time to have virtual things. For example, we're rebooting the Twitch developer stream. Our developer advocacy team manages that. Keep that information up front so people know what's happening. You want content-driven design. The design should support your content rather than the reverse. If you're focusing on the looks, then it's a marketing site. Developers come to your site to find answers, not to be sold to. You want to reduce frustration. The main Point, point of frustration is, I can't find what I need. Search, navigation, I'll go deeper into that later. And make sure to do your user research. Work with your, your UX team if you have one. If not, find a way to do it on your own. Find out what people are going to your site to get and make that and put that up top, promote it. Navigation is really critical because when users are looking to solve something, they may very well go to Google type in their issue, and they can land at any page on your dev portal. Not everybody's coming in from the front. So you want navigation to always be visible. Um, top navigation, um, you want sticky navigation, breadcrumbs, sidebar um, navigation. It can either be openable and closable or not, depending on how much you have. It's important to have page titles and breadcrumbs so that people know where they are. And you want to provide expectations of where to go next, um, related content, and have previous and next buttons. And every single page should have search. And it should have good search. There are a lot of different companies producing that. Your company might have a homegrown one. Go for it. Pick one, use it. Now, layout of your site is really important because that's what makes you know it attractive, right? You want to, first of all, use what's most common because that makes it easier for developers. Industry standards are standard. You want to be able to open parts of the page in full screen, screen mode, such as code snippets or examples or illustrations so that they can see the whole thing and use only the most important components, for example, sticky navigation as fixed elements. Things should be able to you know, pop out or slide. Um, and also white space. White space is really important. It helps prioritize and organize your content elements, and it also establishes hierarchy. If you use white space really well, you might not even need visual elements like borders and boxes because it will be visually clear. And you want to be careful not to have your site look antique and look like frames. Okay, so I've just begun developing a new landing page for the Twitch developer docs, and this is what I have at the moment. The things I have in my mind are minimal graphics, um, icons for each section currently, but that may be reduced because it might become cluttered with icons. We're currently testing this site for two products that will be released this summer, and they're only going to be released to select developers, and I'm going to use their feedback into the final portal product. Um, in the top left corner, you'll see that there's a link to the main developer portal because this is just the doc portal here. The main developer portal is not changing a lot, as far as I know. And currently not there, but I'll be adding them possibly as soon as next week are the standard social media links, 
we have to our forums, to our Discord. We use user voice to collect feedback, and everyone who's a registered um, developer can just give us direct feedback directly in user voice. I monitor that weekly. And oops, so you know, can we just let's have a discussion now. I purposely left a lot of time because I want to hear from you, hear what you're doing, answer your questions. And anyone who's heard me speak before also knows that I tend to run a little short. So I want to turn this over to the group if possible. And while I do that, here's my contact info if you want to reach me. I'm on LinkedIn. I, my email is ilona at ikd.io. And on both Discord and GitHub, I'm Susanna. And people always ask, that's actually um, Middle English for kitchen, because I, I like yeah. to cook. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have absolutely, we have time for question. So you feel free to use the chat. I'll probably start and I'll kick it off. Um, just out of curiosity, with all the experience in the developer portals, um, what was, for example, one of the things that you did in one way and then you realized that it was completely wrong? Something that you said, no, we, we, we totally made it wrong. We even a very bad direction or decision and you had really to back off and rethink a little bit the thing. Let's say the biggest screw up that you that, that happened so far. I'm going to call this a team screw up because yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah, me yeah. personally. But um because this was this was actually something that I came in wanting to fix. Twitch had when I came in Twitch had three versions of the API. One has since been um sunlighted and one, another one is in the process of going away. In the earlier versions, the API doc was not one big long markdown page. It, it like you, the streams APIs, the bits APIs were each a separate document. And when you went in there to change it, it was a lot easier to find things. Mm. The newest version is the one document. giant markdown file. And while that's really nice for search, how it's really difficult for people to maintain. So I'm actually going to break it apart into separate docs again, because as our API grows, it's becoming too too much okay. work. So uh, we have time for two more questions. I'm going to read them both, so you can make probably a single response. So, for what do you use to build the docs? GitHub Markdown or a CMS? And the second one, how does the dedicated DevRel team collaborate with the development team? What is the process? What is the communication they use? These are both really good questions. Um, Elena, we use a hybrid of stuff. We have a CMS, but the CMS uses Markdown, and we're actually moving away from it into pure Markdown files, and they will be displayed on the web through a, home, a homegrown product that Twitch mm -hmm. uses in, the, in Twitch also. We're going to, I'm, I'm moving the documentation into using that. So it's all it's all marked down. Um, the CMS does have a GUI. I tend not to use it because it's clunky. Yeah. <laughs> it's faster to just edit markdown like well, that's the directly. spirit, ineffectively. Um, and Jason, how do we collaborate with the dev teams? We not only collaborate with the dev teams, we also collaborate with products, and that's very important. We make sure that somebody from our team is involved in important meetings. We actually have a weekly go-to-market meeting just amongst us, so we know who has to go talk to whom. Um, there's, a, there's a weekly API meeting where we talk about what's going on with the API to make sure that we're up to date on what's happening, I'm up to date on what needs documenting and everything. We, ha we have really good collaboration, and that's very much due to the fact that I work with really great people. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. I guess I'm, I, I'm, just, I'm lucky there. It's not an issue. And it may be because when I joined, when I joined, I was on the engineering team and I've been reorged around. <laughs> and so I already knew these people. It's not like I got hired into DevRel and then had to go meet engineers and convince them. Yeah, and them. just out of curiosity, what would be kind of the biggest, uh, let's put it, the struggle in communication with the two teams? What would be the biggest one you're having? Time. Oh, time. I really, you know, and every tech writer will always tell you that I really wish that I had earlier access to stuff. Mm, okay. That's a very good one. I, you know, hurry up and wait is the tech writer's life. Right. <laughs> I, there's more I've ever worked that I didn't wish that wasn't the case. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, but I have actually, 
done a couple things towards making that easier on myself. I created a, an SLA for when people file bugs and feature requests, hmm. depending on severity and need, just like every other team has an SLA. Yeah. And I'm working really hard to catch up on back tickets so I can be only working that way. And I, you know, working to gain credibility for documentation by meeting our SLA. That's a very good one. Like this is totally new to me. Uh, seems to be, seems to be very important. All right. I think we're just perfect on time. So thanks again for the presentation. I've been really enjoying that. Uh, if anybody has any other question, you can reach Ilona in private. She's going to be around for a while. So you can, yeah, and go ahead. And like I said, um, please email me. I am absolutely happy to send you my slides. They're not oh, yeah, secret. For sure. <laughs> so you can stop sharing your screen. You can then leave the channel. And in the meantime, we're, we're just perfect in time to introduce the next speaker. Uh, it seems like I'm lucky this, uh, uh, I'm lucky today because I've been presenting the first giant first, uh, Mike Amundsen. Now I'm gonna be presenting the next one, which is probably even bigger maybe. You know, they probably share the same level of authority they have in the API space. So uh, Keen Lane, the API evangelist, I'm quite sure everybody knows him somehow. Um, and he um, has been writing books, communities has been running a blog, the API evangelist.com for probably more than five or even probably 10 years, I don't really remember. And so it's always great to have him here presenting. And he's going to be talking about um, powering the API lifecycle to collections and environments. So uh, let's wait for Kinlane to connect with us. Should be here in a couple of seconds. Uh, seems like there is some technical problem. Okay. Hello, Ken. You're online? Hello. Can you hear me? Absolutely fine. How are you doing? I'm good. Let me get the right camera. Let me shift perspective here. Yeah. Look at the right camera. Cool. Awesome. You're looking at the right camera. So you just make sure to share um, your slides. I already made a very good introduction about you. So everybody knows who you are. You don't need any introduction anyway, I would say. All right, I'm working on the slides. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, where's the slides? So how do I get my slides on here? So if you just down, there is the camera, the microphone, then the share screen and the cogs. There it is. All right. Let's share this. Okay, that works great. So I'm, I'm leaving the stage all for you and take it awesome. away. Sounds good. Cool. Awesome. Well, i um, stoked to be here supporting API Days. Um, I think the longest running uh, conference in the API space that I've uh, supported, um, speaking at the first one, so I'm super stoked to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, about powering the API lifecycle with collections and, and environments. So first, I guess, give a, a quick little intro into to who I am. Um, I think you guys already heard a little bit about me, but my name is Ken Lane. Um, some of you know me as the API evangelist. Um, in the last year, though, I've joined the Postman team, and I'm now the chief evangelist at, at, at Postman. And so not a lot's changing. Um, I'm paying attention to the API lifecycle, and I just get a bigger platform to do it and uh, more customers to talk to. and some more interesting problems to basically see and understand. So I'm here, you know, as chief evangelist and API evangelist to help you kind of understand uh, my view of the API lifecycle and where things are headed. So let's uh, let's kind of play catch up. How did we get here? Um, pretty obvious, you know, there's been some major shifts in the, in the space and what's going on. And mobile for me was the catalyst uh, when I started API Evangelist back in 2010. I saw what was happening with mobile and with web APIs and I was like, I gotta get on board with this. And then of course the cloud, um, Amazon, AWS, uh, EC2, S3, all the APIs they originally launched kind of lit the fire under my imagination about what was possible. And then once everything has kind of gone, you know, APIs in the last decade, We've really seen uh, the shift in architecture from kind of big software applications 
to breaking them down into APIs and microservices. And now we're seeing that, that continue spreading into the event-driven space. So I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm sure. Um, you know, there's an explosion of APIs. There's a lot of them out there. Um, too many for me to even keep track of anymore. Uh, and, but, you know, if you spend any time looking across all these APIs, you know that uh, not all of them are of good quality. If you looked at what's in programmable web today, um, many of them are broken, uh, different designs, just poorly supported. Um, there's many reasons why these APIs are difficult to use. And it's always of concern for me because it really gives APIs a bad name. And I'm really interested in helping people under better understand how, how we can collectively kind of shift the landscape a little bit more. So really one of the biggest disconnects for me it, that I see in the last decade of watching the space is this disconnect between the producer and the consumers. And API providers who launch their APIs are kind of stuck in their little corporate uh, enterprise shells. And it's tough for APIs to bring those, bring you out of those, those bubbles and those shells. Even if your APIs are internal or with partners, you know, just with other groups, um, it's really hard for a lot of people to kind of break out of that and know where to start, how to document, how to communicate, um, troubleshoot, deal with bugs, let alone like have governance and, and other things in place to help kind of streamline the process. And this is all just kind of fundamental API lifecycle dysfunction, that there isn't a view or a vision of the API lifecycle across organizations. So everyone's just kind of doing the best they can in their corners and you end up with what, what you have over time. And so my, you know, my job as the API evangelist for last decade is kind of mapping out, well, what are those stops along the API lifecycle? And if you spend any time looking at all this, you realize, you know, it's not a linear, you know, start to finish type thing when it comes to a, the API lifecycle. And there's multiple dimensions, you know, there's the producer perspective and then there's the consumer perspective. Hopefully all of us have been one or the other at, at different points in time because really being an API consumer makes you a better API producer, but really getting both of these sides of the lifecycle humming and, and working in concert is really what this is all about. And this is what we mean when we say API lifecycle. It's not just how you're developing and deploying your APIs. That consumption is, is a critical aspect of how, how it all works. So, you know, I'm working at Postman now, but I'm really trying to find what are all the building blocks? What are all the, the, the connective tissues that we can define to help bridge the producer and the consumer and make all of this Working as one kind of one life cycle that works in concert, protecting both sides uh, of the coin. And because I'm a developer, because I'm a, I, I, you know, I'm in DevRel at Postman, I'm going to have to leave my slide deck and just kind of show you guys some of this stuff. Um, I can only go so far by a, a PowerPoint presentation. So let's actually dive into Postman and kind of talk about what, uh, what, what I'm talking about here. So. Powering the API lifecycle for me, um, there's there's two real fundamental ingredients that I need to start with when it comes to doing this. Um, most any idea for me always begun begins as a as a GitHub repo. So I usually start a repo and start typing what's going on. And then the second thing that I do is I create a, a Git a Postman workspace because this is where I'm going to start storing all of my artifacts. I'm going to evolve and I'm going to work them. Um, because it's it's the place I've worked for the last seven, eight, eight years, even though I've only worked at Postman for the last year. So this is kind of my native workspace for, for debugging and understanding what APIs are doing. So it makes sense for me to be managing my APIs, kind of the overall lifecycle here. So in all of my APIs begin with a, a contract. And you can find that in Postman. You're probably pretty familiar with your collections here on the left-hand side. But in Postman, we have the notion of the API builder, which has been around for about a year. And then in here, you can have uh, the, your API definitions. And you got a kind of landing page overview of your uh, APIs here, what's going on with it. But really, the cornerstone of it is this contract. And I'm using OpenAPI 3.0 to define this API. But you can use Swagger 2.0, you can use RAML, and you can use GraphQL as your central tool 
doesn't have to be open API. And then this contract is, is synced to GitHub right here using uh, the Postman GitHub sync. And if we jump back to the repo here, you'll see the, the, the file and the version here is sync. This is my open API. So I can use this throughout the API lifecycle in any tool chain, anywhere that I want. It doesn't have to be dependent on, on the Postman workspace with this open API. So this is the truth of my, my API contract here. I have a product API and this is the details of the, you know, what can be expected for each request and response. And so this is the truth of, of my contract and it's in my Postman workspace and it's in my GitHub workspace. Now I can get to work on pushing this API forward through, you know, across its life cycle and kind of adding in the other elements. You know, I can uh, track all of those kind of building blocks and elements here as part of my development dashboard. But it's they're all made up of the same parts and pieces that I'm used to with Postman. So from this contract, I can generate collections. Because for me, a Postman collection is really kind of the fundamental ingredient of, of not just what an API does, but how to use that across the lifecycle, whether I'm developing it or whether I'm consuming it. And so I'm going to generate collections from this open API truth. And you'll see this here in, in my, my collection in my workspace. I have uh, five collections that I've generated from this one truth. And I'm using those collections to actually deliver specific stops along the API lifecycle that I have specific goals and that I want to accomplish. Um, the first is, is to get some documentation published that I can get out and be sharing with my stakeholders, you know, other people on my team and other stakeholders. And I'll publish that docs from this. And I maintain all of my examples and everything that I want to show in that uh, documentation here. I can add examples. I can craft requests exactly how I want this API to, to, to perform. Now, at this point, I'm not actually deploying my API. This is just a, an API design first uh, effort. And I have documentation for it. I can actually mock it. So I could do that with this same collection. I could publish documentation and I can publish mocks from the same collection. But for the purpose of this demonstration and, and, and some other use cases, it's nice to have a separate collection that's only driving the mocks um, because it gives me more granular level control over what that mock actually produces. And then I can actually begin developing my contract tests. So once I actually have a mock, I can actually make calls to that. I have my, um, my base URL here, which it grabs from my environment. So Postman uses environments to uh, really maintain the, the, the state of that API. And in this case, it's a development mock environment, but I can have those for production. I can have those for uh, any, any stage of this API's development. And uh, so I actually have that mock server URL in here. I can make calls to this and I can actually see responses for it. And I can actually start building my contract tests against that. So I've, uh, you know, I've got my my tests defined here for this particular request, and all of this validation. It's looking for a handful of things. Um, I can see the results here as far as my test results. So, does it have a 200 status? Does it have a body? Does it have valid JSON? And then I'm actually using the JSON schema from its open API to actually validate. Uh, the JSON schema as well to make sure it's uh, this request is adhering to my contracts. So I can do my contract testing. So I, I got the three kind of essential ingredients of, uh, of each API. I've got the contract um, here. So I've got the open API contract. I've got that sync to GitHub. I've got my documentation collection published. I've got my mock collection published. I can, I've got my contract test that I can then run um, as, a, as a monitor. So I can run that from multiple regions on a schedule and I can use that to really understand and, and make sure this, pro, this products API um, does everything it's expected to do. And there's mocks and docs always available for that. Now I've got two other collections here. Um, I'm actually separated out my performance testing because I'm gonna be running those monitors in different ways. Um, so I'm just going to be hit, hitting that from different regions and I'm going to be tracking the time and that's going to feed into my status dashboard. 
And then I've started with some basic security. I'm just going to do um, a, a injection on all of the endpoints and have separate security tests. So I'm going to run this on a schedule and I'm going to uh, store those results. And that gives me the kind of full stack of what I need to actually operate this API. And that's pretty fundamental Postman kind of 101 and 201 level stuff is uh, having the contract, deriving your collections uh, to, to drive those specific stops along the API lifecycle and keep them separated, but keep them also validated because here in Postman, um, I can actually validate the, each of those collections against my contract. And if there's any issues found, I can then reconcile those issues. Um, and so this always keeps my, my contracts, testing my, my documentation, mocks, performance and security is always in sync with that central truth. And maybe those changes have occurred in GitHub from some other part of the lifecycle, some other system. Um, and then it gets synced here. And then I see these things are out of sync. I make the changes and, and each stop along the lifecycle is, is uh, operating as expected. So that's, uh, that's the pretty fundamentals. Excuse me, drink some water so I can talk. <coughs> um, where I'm starting to push the boundaries as, as in my role as a chief evangelist is the notion of collections beyond uh, just documenting, testing, mocking, and those kind of core stops along the API lifecycle. How can we do more with these collections as long as um, we have APIs available? So we're, we're building APIs not to, to consume and use them for because we have this API, we're, we're looking to actually move our API forward in the lifecycle using, using APIs. And one of the most obvious is deployment. You know, it's like, how do I actually deploy this API? And so you can see uh, a new, new type of collection here that I've been talking about and pushing forward is this uses AWS API Gateway, Lambda and RDS to actually deploy the API so it actually uh, takes this open API from the, the API builder, um, grabs this contract, and then it'll actually step through and, and build out that API. You build out all the lambdas, build out the RDS backend, and then it ends by testing. Uh, it actually does some API management uh, stuff. It makes sure it's got a key and it's got some basic security. And then I've got uh, another one with the management if I want. And so these are part of what I consider operational level collections. So they don't actually live here in this workspace. Um, I have a, an operational workspace uh, that they live in, but then I can share them in, in here when I need to run them. So when I need to deploy a copy of this API into any stage of development, I can just share this centralized collection, run it um, as a runner, run it manually, and then, uh, store the results of that run here in an environment. So again, I'm pushing forward um, the notion of, of what an environment is for. I'm not maintaining the state of the development or the, the production of that API as a client. I'm uh, storing the results of deploying that API. So where was it deployed? When was it deployed? Who deployed it? Um, other pipeline related stuff, code gen, code validation things. So I'm actually deploying that API and the results are stored here. Um, I can do the same for management, um, create an environment, and that's the management snapshot of this API. I can have usage statistics and data and, and that, that all stored as, as its own artifact. And then what this allows me to really do is give you a sneak peek into more governance level collections is I'm able to actually govern uh, the API contract here, I have a governance collection that's that's created by a central ops group. And I, as a developer, can run this and say, you know, does the name of my API meet our requirements? Are the paths, you know, meet our dictionary and kind of vocabulary? I can dive into methods, parameters, make sure things are camel case. I can validate the request body structure, headers, um, make sure that the, the open API here is as robust and complete as it possibly can. And so you can create collections that are very granular and modular and let you uh, work with uh, not just the APIs, 
but the actual uh, structure and and uh, operations of those APIs. And then, oops, I got out of there before I dove in. You can actually see the results of those of those tests, and you can. Um, oops, I got to I got to load the right uh, the right environment. And you can see the results of those tests here um, using the same mechanisms that we use to actually test our API. Uh, but rather than testing the API in its request and response, we're evaluating the structure of the API and does the, the open API contract reflect that structure. So we're just using the same testing uh, infrastructure to uh, up empower uh, ops level governance collections. So these are, are three kind of operational level collections I wanted to introduce everyone to. They're very different than, than your API specific uh, collections that, that you have. Um, they're, you know, the, the products collections I have here are, while they're generated from the, the central truth of the API, they're um, very, very specific to this API contract, this products API, where these ops one are actually defined by central governance. They're created in a standardized way to kind of reflect the organizational strategy. And then they can be shared within the workspaces where they need to be applied. And then because they use the same testing infrastructure, you can also run those at the at the pipeline layer using Newman if you want to actually automate any of this. But I recommend, especially with governance, that, that you uh, make it a soft governance and let people just start running those collections on their own. But that should give you a, a, a quick intro into uh, how, how collections and environments can be used to drive, define, drive, report and then govern on the the overall api lifecycle. um so just kind of showing you how how postman can be used again as a swiss army knife to kind of allow you to to come at your your api lifecycle in different ways define what governance means to you because this isn't governance defined by postman this is governance defined um, using some standard collections but you can customize and tweak them and add to them and really define what governance means to your organization. And it's not baked into Postman um, as a feature. So it's not, you don't have that, that vendor lock in um, because you have a, a open source collection you can run with an open source runner, but then you're building it in a proprietary tool, you know, that is Postman's tool. So it's kind of that, that, that interesting balance between uh, you know, SaaS solutions and open source and open API solutions that that I love because we all got to make money. We all need powerful tools, but we all need that flexibility and control to 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 define our own API lifecycle, um, implement it how we want, and then when we want to scale that and uh, further automate and report, collaborate and share, then you can either use Postman, you can use GitHub, you can use other mechanisms for those processes, and we just dovetail with that and work wherever you want to use postman so with that said i'll jump back to my my deck here um and just kind of leave you thinking about you know this this relationship between uh collections and, and the open api this is kind of a snapshot of how i have my operational workspace where i define my api lifecycle. i define what is a uh, governance for not just design but actual what is governance for testing? What is governance for performance and security and support? And so I can actually define collections that audit that across individual workspaces where APIs are being developed. And those APIs could be very large or they could be, you know, microservices. Um, depends, it's up to you how you, how big or how small you, you define your APIs. And so this gives a little look at how you can get more standardized about your life cycle, because in my opinion, you can't measure, you can't report upon what you don't uh, have defined. And uh, and this kind of gives you a look at kind of the next steps of how you can define that, not just with open API contracts, but also Postman collections and environments, and then use workspaces and, and repositories to orchestrate that across the enterprise. So anyways, with that said, oh, so let me go back into presentation mode so it looks prettier. Um, Check out the Postman platform. I'm sure um, you've already got it, it downloaded, but if you um, head over to the website and, and take a test drive and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Keen. It was very good. 
Uh, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to be reading two of them at the same time, and so you can you can respond to all of them. The first one hey. from uh, Stephen Price. I think I know this guy, by the way. So what method do you recommend for translating a Postman collection into an OpenAPI description, if you have any? And then the second one from Miguel Munoz. Can we run the tests outside of Postman using Maven, Gradle, or something else? And then in general, just reading the chat for you, people is kind of excited about this idea of management collections. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are open source tools out there for generating uh, Postman collections from OpenAPI. We have, Postman has one, but there's a couple of others. I recently did a profiling of all the open source tools that are Swagger, OpenAPI, Postman, Collection, even async uh, API related. And so you can head to API Evangelist. There's quite a few uh, lists of those over the last couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, there's, and I want to keep investing in those tools. So Postman to Collections, Collections to Postman, um, and try to, uh, you know, give a little insight. It's not entirely public. We haven't announced it, but we're, we're joining the OAI. So really, uh, really important to us to, to help you be part of that and just really support the open spec. So and what's the second part of that first question? I'm uh, sorry. Is think. it possible to run the tests outside of Postman using yeah. Mabel and Gradle or something else? Yeah. So you can define the collections. You can write your, your Node.js scripts as part of those collections to test. And you can run those in Postman manually. You can run them as monitors on a schedule using the Postman platform. Um, and you can run them as runners in Postman. And, and sure, we want you running them in Postman. And that's our, you know, we want to help you scale those. And, and that's how part of our business model. But then we also have Newman, which is an open source runner. And that you can run. It's Node.js. It's on, um, on GitHub. And you can use it to run those uh, collections anywhere you want. So the resulting collection and, and the runner, those are, are both open source. You can run them anywhere you want. Do anything you want with them. Fantastic. That's a, that's a very good news. OK, uh, we're actually good in time. So you can um, leave the channel when you're ready. While Again, thank you again for being with us today. And I'll be introducing our next speaker. Um, so we have Karen Sore. I, I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing this correctly. And the topic is going to be how GDPR, these little weird things of the privacy that everybody is kind of scared about, um, I think there is even a website that is going to generate an email to send to somebody to request for GDPR information that's going to just drive them nuts. But in this case, is how GDPR can aid your documentation. You already shared your screen. That's fantastic. You know the rules. Uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Vincenzo. Thank you so much for having me here at API Days. It's a great honor to be here, and I'm really glad to be able to talk to you about the topic which is surprisingly my favorite, the topic of JDPR. Um, my name is Karen Sorry, so you pronounce it all right. Uh, I've been a technical writer for all, more than six years now, and for more than three years of the six, I've been a technical writer in cryptography, in crypto, which I want to remind you, it's not cryptocurrency, but uh, crypto equations and cryptography and encryption. So uh, before you run away from me and um, decide that it's a security talk, I'll tell you that it's part a security talk and part documentation talk. And since I want to tell you what is GDPR and how it can aid you in writing better documentation, uh, more precise documentation, documentation that can be and uh, can provide better help to your users, uh, let's define what is GDPR. So, uh, contrary to a popular Twitter belief, it's nowhere near the goddamn privacy regulation. It's general data protection regulation, and it applies to all citizens of the European Union, and it protects their privacy and their data. Uh, in uh, Great Britain, there is a counterpart to GDPR, which is called the DPI, Data Protection Bill, which was actually adopted about a year before GDPR, and which is uh, rather similar to GDPR. Also, uh, legislation that wants to protect you and your data and your privacy from all the bad things out there on the Internet. 
Uh, in uh, the USA, the counterpart to GDPR is the CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act, which is um, basically GDPR targeted at what you share when you buy something, to put it really in a crude way. So, but how is really GDPR necessary and why? And why did uh, governments on such a grand scale had to come up with something that would be able to protect you and your data and my data and everybody else's data from uh, people who would want to misuse it? Well, the joke that governments simply didn't want to have competition on that one, you know? Have you ever had some of your documents lost or maybe misplaced somewhere uh, while you have have been applying to something. Um, but actually, there are easier examples. Let's think about Equifax, maybe Dropbox, Yahoo, LinkedIn, and of course, Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook. All those were not just breaches, but breaches and uh, leaks of, cons of uh, personal data on a grand scale. And to prevent that, something on a grander scale was necessary. You know what is the problem with um, providing security measures on a large scale or even on any kind of scale? The problem is that security has negative value, which means that uh, when you implement something that's good and useful, it's good and useful straight away. You can show your progress, you can um, demonstrate what uh, the thing you have implemented does and how it actually aids your business, maybe it aids your users and consumers. But with security, uh, the best you can do is uh, probably just a shrug from a manager who says, well, there have been no leaks so far and we are trying managing. By the way, my presentation is going to have a lot of funny pictures. So I'd appreciate uh, if something catches your fancy, share it on, on Twitter. There is my handle in the upper left corner. So, uh, well, returning to the notion of managers and security, when you try to suggest something security-wise, it's all what you get. No one wants to spend extra on security until there is data breach. But as I said, I've been working uh, for more than three years in security, and I think that better security and privacy and encryption is a good thing. Well, at least better security than nothing is a good thing already. So when GDPR was announced, uh, we actually we have been celebrating. Yeah, we cryptographers are just weird like that. But you know what the problem is? Uh, before I tell you what the problem is, I'll ask you um, to think about this. Uh, any ideas what this beautiful device, actually two models of this beautiful device are? Just take a look at this awesome thing. I will not turn to further. It's um, Nokia Communicator 9000 made in 1996. What's so special about it? It's the hottest smartphone of 1996. And here is the first iPhone introduced in 2007. And the problem is that the legislation that regulated data, mobile data, internet, internet privacy, consumer data privacy that was in use before GDPR in, which came into full force in May 2018. So that legislation was uh, adopted in 1995. So it's legislation that was adopted before the smartphone, Nokia Communicator 9000, before the first iPhone. So you understand it was not the wild, wild west we have been living in. It was basically um, some prehistoric period and prehistoric legislation that had to regulate our data and the and communication and that was only advancing into the future. So here is the timeline on the grander scale of things. And it actually honestly scares me, to be honest with you. Which brings us to GDPR. A useful thing, now you know that it's a useful thing because uh, it was implemented to, you know, somehow deal and regulate the data that was out there after 1995, all the data. And what uh, is a good product without good documentation, right? So we're going to see how GDPR aids your API or conceptual documentation and how GDPR um, aids you uh, in providing better service to your users.
GDPR targets obscurity. One of the main and central points in GDPR is that it demands explicit consent from users who have read or have seen and they actually understand what they are agreeing or disagreeing to when interacting with your content, in our case documentation or subscription forms. So when you see subscription forms like this, uh, JDPR demands uh, that you actually make your users understand what they're agreeing to. But before I elaborate on this, uh, let's, uh, let me tell you a short story. So, no, it's a story. So one beautiful morning in London, um, a few people waiting for the morning bus had a chance to connect to a free Wi-Fi spot, public spot. And they could have had a free browsing session, you know, free Wi-Fi. If they only agreed and put a check mark that they agree to use this spot. And of course, no one read the documentation and no one read that um, agreement as they have been agreeing to the catch. Uh, this uh, Wi-Fi spot was actually um, installed there by a security company, which include a heard clause that promised free Wi-Fi in return for the um, newborn child of the people who connected to that Wi-Fi for the duration of the whole inter eternity. Of course, they never claimed the children, but um, this was a survey to demonstrate how badly we read the documentation, how badly we read the license agreements, and also the yes and then. But you know what? No one's got time for that, and even us, we do not always read the documentation or license agreements, right? This brings us to what I call the vicious circle of ignored documentation. First, the docs are hard to read, you know. We do not want to spend much time editing the docs or making them clearer because people don't read the docs anyway, right? That's what the developers often tell us. So why bother? So we deliver barely readable, a highly complicated documentation, which will do. And as a result, no one reads the docs because they're hard to read. Which leads us to the vicious circle. So JDPR brings us to tailoring documentation that's compliant with JDPR and with its explicit um, way of putting things into human language. So again, how this applies to our documentation? because our documentation is not only words that cover uh, our products. Our documentation is a way to communicate with humans who want to use our products. So if we do not speak human language, uh, it just, well, everything is alien to our readers and people cannot, um, you know, people just cannot um, interact with our products at the best way they could. So the thing is we should strive for the simplest uh, ways to put our words and to, and to, to provide people with simplest ways to describe what our product actually does. No, one's, well, no one wants to read your complicated corporate lingo, right? No one wants to know your internal stuff. People just want to show up on your documentation page. They want to hook up to your API or they want to download your product and just run it with no problems. So if they uh, just see walls and walls of complicated text, uh, you will be breaking GDPR by design because uh, it, it's not explicit consent that you're getting from people. You're just confusing people and clicking yes to your documentation and to your subscription forms, which is not what you should do. Instead of putting I agree, agree, agree or next buttons everywhere, we should explicitly tell people what they're agreeing to like this. So I think you've been seeing more and more of such subscription forms that ask you um, to confirm that you explicitly agree to a certain thing like here. And here are some real world examples. I think this one I took at an airport somewhere where this approach was already adopted, I think if you just a few months into GDPR where every point that could have been a wall of text is already a clear statement which allows the user as a reader to say yes and no while understanding exactly what they're agreeing to. But well, content is just the surface. And beyond the surface of documentation, what we impose on the readers, on our users, 
is uh, an underground layer of documentation, uh, which is the information that users actually share with us to get to that documentation. I think everybody have been pretty sick of all those emails like we updated our privacy policy, please uh, agree to receive the news updates from us, right? And we were laughing at it. And uh, everyone is always laughing at such um, websites that ask you to input credit card information and then of course it's stolen from you. But the thing is, why do we ask our users to do the same thing when we ask them for an email when we do not need them to share that email? When we ask the users to um, input some information we do not need. Actually, I've seen a question here on chat before I started my talk. Uh, somebody was asking, why was there a form uh, asking for the gender of a person uh, participating in this conference. So that's the example of some information that the user prefers not to share. Which brings us to the fact that GDPR classifies uh, documentation, uh, information and data into personal data and personal sensitive data. And personal data can include your name, email. So, you know, basically what I, I like to describe it as information that will, will not really get you into trouble. Probably the information that least likely to get you into trouble if it goes public. And there is also personal sensitive data, which includes race, ethnic origin, politics, you know, um, genetics. So I'd like to classify it for myself as information that if leaked, without your explicit consent can lead you into real trouble. So remember that when you ask users for any kind of information which you think you want from them, when you provide them with an access to your documentation or some other information, you know, freebies on your website, uh, some tutorials or maybe free materials that can be downloaded only after the users of your information portals uh, leave their email, you may be leading them into danger without knowing that. Why? Because it's, you know, it's never just a password. Here's just another short question for you. Um, and I'll try to ask it myself, maybe on my expense. So have you ever just entered your email with some generic password on some website? just to get to some information quickly? Or have you ever reused the password? I'm sorry to say that even after three years in security, I s I'm guilty of doing that. Maybe not anymore, but I think before, knowing all that's going on under the hood, I was guilty of that, and most of us are. And the thing is, the problem is that with the help uh, of rainbow table attack, dictionary attacks, uh, the malicious attackers can just take the keys to your other information because you know some silly password that you entered 10 years ago on some silly website uh, could have been reused by you because it's just a really convenient password to use the one it's really convenient to remember on some more important website right where maybe uh, not as important as your banking information but there you in put in the name of your first pet and then the malicious attackers can just go and you know hack your banking information and get to your information step by step so you know that's great power and great responsibility now that you know that just by holding your um, subscribers emails when you don't need to you're probably you getting them into danger there is a really great TED talk by dale harvey uh, from twitter uh, which um, um tells you how a picture of your cat can get you into danger and even lead to your death. I highly recommend watching this TED talk uh, for, you know, home this topic in, that all the access information that leaks about you or about your user outside can lead to grave consequences. And which is why we need to remember that when asking for any kind of information from the people who want to read our content. So knowing this and knowing that any information leaking out can uh, lead our users to trouble, we just need to understand that all information is sensitive. And we need to keep our requirements towards our users really low and really simple. 
If you want to read the information, come on, read the information. If you want people to subscribe to read our information, we need to provide some value in return, and we need to explain what is going um, to be done with that information for people to be able to subscribe. Yes, you probably heard it all before, and you unsubscribe or subscribe to some subscription form online yourself, but it's still happening and we still ask for access to information and we do not encrypt it, which can lead to grave and dangerous consequences for your users. So keep things simple and don't over um, complicate the language you're using when you're addressing your um, users. If you collect more information um, uh, to provide the access to your API sandboxes or maybe to sandboxes to try your products online. Make sure that you uh, keep all the information separate. Make sure that you keep all the instances of information and all the instances of your software separate. And if you implement this, uh, like security by design is one of the main uh, central points of GDPR. So if you implement this, show to, to users how you do implement this, because this is really important. And this makes and puts people at ease much more. For instance, uh, here in a piece of documentation I've created, um, I explicitly warned people about the grave consequences of doing something with a product. And here, um, Berlin Airport um, informed me about all the things I'm going to do with my information once I connect to the Wi-Fi. So see, GDPR is actually caring for us. And I have a really funny story about GDPR and care. You know, when GDPR was only taken, uh, coming into full power in May 2018, so one of my, no, actually most of my banks did not have the option to, you know, to unsubscribe from something or maybe to provide my consent to actually giving them some information I would not like to be sharing with them. But one of the rock bands that I really like, Fields of Nephilim, they were the first ones to put up the cookie policy wall on their website and the GD and implement GDPR policy. So that's the example of caring for your users through GDPR. So now after this, let's sum it up, probably. So first of all, even GDPR implemented uh, to the best of your ability in your documentations and not uh, bulletproof. It's not, you know, a silver bullet in itself. It's just one of different tools to help you provide documentation that is useful and that is simple and is actually like does not uh, lead your users into more danger than they should be in. And JDPR should be just treated as uh, just another style guide. You know, as technical writers, as writers, uh, many of us you know Chicago manual of style, you know, so should praise and Google developer manual of style, all of them. So treat JDPR as just like another manual of style that actually brings something really useful to your readers. And well, now that you know, welcome to the security team because we are all part of the security team in these times. As, as a further reading, I'd love you to, to actually read the full text of GDPR if you haven't already. There is a full text of GDPR and there is um, not divided into any kind of uh, chapters. And there is this um, mm, more useful text of GDPR. I think I will provide the links after I'm done with my talk into the chat because yeah, I forgot to remake this into clickable links. I'm you for credits. And well, thank you for having me. I think I'm ready to be answering the questions now. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we do have one question from Stephen Price again, and I think uh -huh. I've answered it, but let's go, let's go through that anyway. Like, do you have any reference we can research online for GDPR style guide that it's not the official documentation, which is probably too boring for everybody here in the audience? I will share in a few minutes um, in the chat um, an article on what we really need to encrypt according to GDPR and other style and other um, privacy regulations like HIPAA and FDA. 
and I will share the links to the full text of GDPR and to the um, and to the better um, better formatted version of GDPR. So you ask about something more practical than the actual regulation. Hmm. Uh, the, actually, the regulation is really practical. As I said, I read it. Uh, I read it in full, and it's very eye-opening. I will actually recommend that you at least live through the you know, some you know summary of GDPR of uh, British uh, Privacy Act and of CCPA, and this will put things into a pers perspective, and you'll be able to deal with um, these privacy issues with more efficiency. Yeah. Okay. I guess that answers the question. Uh, I, okay. Thank you very much for being with us today. We're actually super in time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you can stop sharing your presentation. You can actually also leave the chat. And uh, with this presentation, uh, for the people that are still connected with us, this concludes uh, the second part of the conference. So we're going to have a break of 20 minutes. We'll be back with the sessions later. Uh, this is going to be my last uh, moderation of the day. It has been a pleasure to stay here with you virtually. Uh, again, my name is Vincenzo Ganese. I'm writing you from Austin, Texas. I work for Stoplight, and we provide tools for API developers. You can check out the website if you're interested. Um, have a wonderful day, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Good Goodbye. <laughs>